how do you see uh, Brazil and Latin America shaping the tokenization and the and the adoption of the CBCs? Uh, can you talk more about about this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I think Latin America has historically been a, a big adopter of tokenization already. I think there's a lot of uh, usage of tokenized cash. There's a lot of usage of Bitcoin already in different Latin American countries. Some Latin American countries even have Bitcoin on their balance sheet. And so there's there's definitely a different mindset in Latin America about Web3 and tokenization. And I think that's because Web3 and tokenization provides certain guarantees, technical guarantees, that the asset will always be available to the private key holder, that the asset can always be viewed, that it's basically under the control of the person holding the asset, right? And I, I think that's very attractive to Latin America, and it, it basically is a way to manage risk um, against the existing systems there. I think tokenization, as we've shown in our work together on the tokenization of soy and the ability to trade it across borders, shows that there's a lot of assets inside of Latin America that can be tokenized. Uh, real estate-related assets, commodities, uh, all kinds of assets, I think, are going to become tokenized in Latin America. Latin America is a huge producer of all kinds of different commodities, uh, farmed kind of foods and goods and all kinds of things that I think will become tokenized and that I think can be then traded and sent all over the world in an efficient way and paid for in an efficient way. Good. Uh, and the, how, how does this kind of programmable settlement uh, change the game for the central banks? I, I think the ability to programmatically create conditions for what your central bank digital currency can be used for is a very powerful tool that some central banks understand and some central banks don't fully understand. So if, if you make a central bank digital currency, you can have a wholesale relationship with the, the banks in your ecosystem, or you can have a retail relationship, or you could actually do something closer to, some, to universal basic income where you give out central bank digital currency to the population. And you know that it's reaching them because you know that central bank digital currency is hitting all the relevant wallets. But in, in all three of those relationships, you, you have an interesting, an interesting dynamic where now you can make it conditional about what the currency is used for or the risk conditions that the underlying currency can be involved in. And that's because you can automate the conditions of the currency usage. And that is something that I think central banks will find attractive and, and, and will find useful. And it could actually allow them to give out more currency to certain places or certain groups if they can properly control the conditions under which that currency is used. Okay, but I want to hear from you uh, about what, what needs to, be, to happen before this uh, scales globally. Uh, some, is it, is it uh, something technical, uh, policy, or both, both of them? I think the biggest hurdle right now is still the legal hurdle. I think the technology has matured in, in many ways in terms of scalability, and our technology has matured as proven by the transaction we did with you and the, the central bank, where we're able to do very complex transactions across multiple chains with multiple steps, multiple jurisdictions, multiple pieces of data. Um, I think that the, the final thing is really going to be getting the institutions more comfortable to do stuff on chain in more ways. So tokenizing more things, using the central bank digital currency uh, for more collateral or, or various other relationships with users, basically getting the institutional world to go full steam into tokenization, to go full steam in adopting CBDCs, to go full steam into adopting basically on-chain finance. And and this is the thing that I, I, I think is, is now going to happen over literally the next few uh, few months, year, year and a half, I think the United States uh, accelerating its adoption of tokenization 
is is going to be a massive force that that helps drive adoption by other governments. Um, and and some of those governments, like the government of Brazil, have already been very far ahead, have already been doing a lot of adoption of tokenization and blockchain technology. So once it becomes more accepted in other jurisdictions, I think it'll just speed everyone up. So the legal and institutional adoption hurdle, in my opinion, is still the biggest hurdle, but it's now in the process of being uh, very rapidly removed. Oh, great. And the, what, what do you think happens next on the tokenization trend? Can you get, give I, us some, some sites? Yeah, I, I think what's going to happen is there's going to be more tokenized cash, stable coins, tokenized deposits, central bank digital currencies, various forms of payment on chain. That's going to create a big market. So right now, the, the market for on-chain payments is not big enough. It's in the 200 to 300 billion range. But if it becomes 2 trillion or 3 trillion, that's a lot of on-chain capital that can buy your tokenized asset. So you have the kind of purchasing power and the buy side on chain. Then you're going to have the sell side. So the issuer, the tokenization, similar to the type of tokenization we did together with you, where we were able to tokenize soy, send it, you know, across the world, exchange it for, for, for payment. So, so basically you're going to have the sell side grow more issuances of basically everything, equities, commodities, and funds. Interestingly enough, right now, funds are ahead. There's more tokenized funds as real-world assets than there are uh, tokenized equities or commodities. But I think all three of those categories will accelerate. And so then you'll have a lot of value to pay on-chain, stable coins, tokenized deposits, central bank digital currencies like Drex. That'll be on-chain payment. And then you'll have um, large and high-quality tokenized stuff equities, commodities, funds. And that'll naturally lead to markets and growth. And then what people will realize is that the markets for those tokenized equities, commodities, and funds, they work better than the traditional markets. So for example, in the traditional markets, you can post collateral in many cases, 21.5. So 21 hours a day, five days a week. In the tokenized, asset world, you can post collateral 24-7, 365. You have different settlement times. You have different risk management practices. You, you have uh, entirely new levels of efficiency. So once you have the purchasing power from the tokenized cash, and once you have the sell side issuances, you naturally have market activity. And then everyone's going to look at that market activity and say, wow, these markets work so much better than the TradFi markets. Mm -hmm. When they understand that, I think that's when the amount of cash and the amount of issuance goes way up. Because now everybody says, look, you know, I, I don't really want collateral. I don't want to buy something from you if I can only post it 21.5. Why don't you give me that in a tokenized form so I can use it as collateral 24-7, 365? Because, you know, that's what I'm now used to with the with with the blockchain based finance stuff I've been exposed to that's really kind of you know the direction I think we'll end up in yeah yeah so okay, uh, we have a lot of questions to, to ask you but you are out out of time uh, again thank you very much for being here with us uh, today at blockchain Rio. I really appreciate it it's my pleasure. It's been great working with you and with the Central Bank. I hope we can do much more together. It's really been my pleasure. Thank you very much.